Well, I gather that uh, you can see me and I can see you and and uh, it's good to be with you. Good morning. Thank you for the pleasure of remembering the Lord with you this morning. There's no service that I know of more precious to me than the Lord's table. And it's good to be opening the scriptures to you today. Uh, Mr. Adams certainly made it clear we need to open the Bible and, uh, and read the good messages. And so that's what we'll do right now. Uh, as our text this morning, uh, I'm going to choose a, a fragment of an old hymn. It's in the Bible. It's as old as the Bible is, at least as old as uh, the Apostle Paul is. And uh, in one of his letters, he mentions a verse, I guess it is, or part of a verse from uh, a hymn. Now, I don't know who gives the titles to these messages when you publish them on the internet, but I have noticed that you like to have a title. So I'll give you a title. It might be Malcolm maybe that does that or Haniel. I'm not sure who does that. Anyway, I'm gonna suggest the title for this talk is the song of the godly, the song of the godly. Now, I can see you well enough to know that some of you, I think, are already turning to the passage. You know what I'm talking about because you know your Bibles and you know where this uh, fragment of a hymn is in the Bible. Well, it's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. So I'll invite you to uh, turn there. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And it begins with the title, if you will, or the, an introduction to the hymn. The introduction to the hymn is great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. And then the Apostle Paul quotes, this fragment of a hymn. We wish we had the whole hymn, but obviously God has intended that we not have it, that we uh, focus on this particular verse. So here it is. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit. He was seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations. He was believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Now, if you have your Bibles open, you will notice that I paused at certain points. I think there are three verses here, actually, with two lines in each. And let me read it again like, like that. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations believed on in the world, taken up in glory. It's poetry. It's a work of art. We don't know who wrote the hymn, but I think whoever he or she was spent some time thinking this all through and writing this down. So to get it neat and say exactly what the, the author or the, the composer wanted it to say. It's poetry. God is a poet. God is an artist. In fact, when we read in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are his workmanship, that word for workmanship connotes a work of art, especially a poem. We are his poem. We are his work of art. Now I get excited about that, but that maybe that's just because I'm a romantic and uh, you don't think in romantic terms, maybe, 
Uh, it's too bad, but I'm not going to belabor that. It's just that I just think it's wonderful that we have this part of a hymn that goes right back to the time of the Apostle Paul when he was writing this letter to Timothy. Now, if you have your Bibles open, you can notice that before he gets to the hymn, verses 1 to 13 are the qualifications for leadership in the local church, elders and deacons. And these qualities, piety, devotion, faithfulness, trustworthiness, maturity, obedience, allegiance to God, all those uh, qualifications could be expressed in some way in one word, godliness. Godliness. The leaders of the church are to be godly. As for church obligations, specifically church obligations, it says that the elders must be able to teach. That's verse 2. The deacons must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Verse 9. The elders are to be able to speak, which means they have to be learners. You can't teach what you don't know by learning. So the elders are learnings. They, they learn and they preach. They teach. The deacons hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. That is, they're able to discern when the teaching's wrong, when it's false teaching. A lot about that in this epistle to Timothy. And they have to be free from doctrinal error, from making mistakes in their own thinking. Now those, that of course applies to the elders as well and should be a, should, should apply to all of the people in the church. So qualifications of elders and deacons. And then in verses 14 and 15, Paul says he hopes to visit Timothy, but if he's delayed, he writes so that Timothy, here it is, may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. So Timothy is to read that and then point out to others that fact that they must, they ought to be, how to behave a certain way in the household of God so that he can teach and lead by example. This epistle to 1 Timothy, to Timothy, is pretty much about protecting the church from false teachers. That's a big idea, a big point of Paul's message to Timothy. And then the second message, I would say, is the need for godliness in the congregation. I don't know how many times, I think it's eight times the word godliness is used in this letter to Timothy. Verse, chapter 2, verse 2 says, we are to lead quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness. And in verse 6 of chapter 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. And that takes us to our text. Because that's how this hymn is introduced. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of of godliness. So the title of the, the hymn or the sermon is Song of the Godly. So we're dealing with a great mystery having to do with, you guessed it, godliness. And we need to unpack it. So let's take some time this morning to look at this hymn in a little bit of detail. It will not be exhaustive, but uh, that will get us started in a way. So what is godliness? In the original language, Eusebia, godliness means piety, devotion, religion, the duty that man owes to God. So the hymn that we're going to look at, and we've already read, is a summary of doctrine, teaching, that transforms the Christian life. It's the teaching that transforms 
the Christian life leading to a godlier existence, more pious, more devoted to God, more dutiful in obedience to God. So as the believer increasingly appreciates the wonder of his Savior, his redemptive work doctrine, he is progressively transformed, as the apostle tells us in 2 Corinthians, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, and that's particularly the glory of the Lord in his Calvary work, we're all being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. In other words, as we think about this hymn and really consider it carefully and worship the one of whom this, the hymn speaks, the Lord Jesus, obviously, we are changed into his image. We become more godly, more pious, more devoted to God. The goal of this great mystery is godliness. But you say, what's the mystery? Well, as you know, in the Bible, that word for mystery often means, very often means, something hidden in the Old Testament and revealed in the New. Something hidden in the Old Testament and revealed in the New. For instance, in chapter 3 of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul writes this. You have heard how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. Paul says there was a mystery. There was a, the solution to it was made to me by revelation. The Holy Spirit gave him this information. And he goes on to say this mystery, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. This mystery, and here it is, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That the mystery was hidden in the Old Testament, made clear in the New, and Paul now knows this, that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, would be included in the promises made to Jesus Christ or in Jesus Christ for salvation. Now, if you're a thinker, you might say, you know your Bible, you might say, but didn't the Old Testament speak of Gentiles being included in the salvation? Isaiah 49, 6 says, and it's God talking to his servant, the Messiah, who would still come, the Lord Jesus. God is speaking and he's saying this. I will make you, the Messiah, as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And then Isaiah 52, 10, the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Sounds a lot like saying the Gentiles are going to be Save too. But we read that verse, those verses in the Old Testament, having understood that the Messiah has come and he is indeed the Savior of the whole world. But those that read Isaiah's prophecy in the first place, didn't have the wisdom that we have today, this side, being able to take the New Testament and go back and read the Old Testament and understand it better than the people of God could then. In fact, the, the, the Israelites at the time might very well have been thinking to themselves when they read those verses, well, it can't be God coming Surely it isn't God himself who's coming. He's sending another, uh, the Messiah. And he gives that Messiah some special qualities that have to do with, with deity. And with the Gentiles coming in, actually I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself in my notes here. Just bear with me. So 
what was the what was the great mystery then that Paul's referring to in our in our hymn? Well, we need to get into a study of it, don't we? Let's let's get right at it here. Let's get into the hymn. First verse, first line. He was manifested in the flesh. Now, right, right again, you right up the front here, you might not realize we have a problem. <laughs> Who is the he? My Bible says he was manifested in the flesh. The actual fact is that in the, in the oldest manuscripts, the word is who, W-H-O, who was manifested in the flesh. And some later manuscripts about the fourth century, it's God is put in there, was manifested in the flesh. But Paul's quoting from a hymn, and he's only quoting part of it. <laughs> and if you read the hymn, You'd, if you'd been singing the hymn, you'd have known who he was referring to because he says who. Well, we won't belabor that too much. We know who the who is, don't we? We know who the who is. It refers to God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. God in Christ was manifested in the flesh. The hymn is all about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is God made known. That's a reference to the incarnation, isn't it? It's the union of true deity and true humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. God, Jehovah, Yahweh, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the, the heaven with a span, enclosed the dust in, of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. The ones to whom the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the earth. That God is made known through Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, by the Son of God becoming flesh at the incarnation, Christmas, if you will. But listen to this passage from, from Nahum chapter 1. The Lord who is jealous and avenging, avenging and wrathful, who takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord who is slow to anger and great in power, who will by no means clear the guilty, who is a stronghold in the day of trouble and knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. That God declares who he is and makes himself known, makes himself visible, uh, visible through Jesus Christ in the flesh, his humanity. He was manifested in the flesh. Made visible, disclosed, that word that, uh, word that we have there, manifest, made visible or disclosed in the flesh, not in sinful flesh. The Lord Jesus had no sin in him, not in sinful flesh, but in spotless human flesh. A real man, we've mentioned that so many times in our series. Not all flesh is the same, we're told in 1 Corinthians, but there is one kind of human, another humans, another for animals. God, in all that he is, was made visible publicly by way of Christ's humanity. John puts it this way. The word, an abstract, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I like to put it this way. God in Christ has a human face. God in Christ has a human face because by way of incarnation, he is indeed human. Truly God, truly God in the eternal Trinity, truly human, 
in that which he took up for himself and on himself as being made in human flesh. He was manifested. He was made clear. He was introduced for our learning by way of the incarnation. That is the great mystery. That is the great, I think that is the great mystery of all mysteries. That's the greatest revelation of all revelation. That God declared everything he is and made clear to us all by way of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming into the world and became, becoming one of us, outside of sin, one of us. So that as we've mentioned over and over again in this series, he is truly God and truly human. And we can see him in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, was that mystery hidden in the Old Testament? That the Messiah would be God, and here's where I was getting ahead of myself. Well, there are hints of it. There are hints of that truth in the Old Testament, but once again, it's not really particularly clear if you don't have haven't read your New Testament. In fact, one author says that these texts in the Old Testament are notoriously enigmatic. It's just you're left wondering, what is this really saying? For instance, in these verses we know too, listen to these. This is Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. You, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too loyal to be among the clans of Judah, from you will come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. Now listen, whose coming forth is from old from ancient days, and your Bible might, mean, might read from eternity. That sounds an awful lot like God, doesn't it? Isaiah 9, verse 6, his name will be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father. We understand that, that that is God. Who else could it possibly be that the Messiah is God, fully and truly God? And yet those who read that text, the first readers of the Old Testament scriptures, could easily read those verses and say, well, it can't possibly be God. That's, too, that's way out of, out of reality. It must be a, a, a wonderful man coming with certain qualities, divine qualities that are given to him, but it can't possibly be God. But in our hymn that we're studying, our hymn declares unequivocally, God in his fullness is made manifest in the human flesh of Jesus Christ. Now we understand that Old Testament. Well, we don't know what's being hinted at. God just used hints in the Old Testament. That's what didn't, didn't reveal this truth in all of its splendor until the Lord Jesus himself came. Second, second, uh, line in, in the hymn, vindicated by the Spirit. Dikaio. It means justified. In fact, your Bible might read that justified in the Spirit or by the Spirit. Declared righteous or vindicated. I think that's that, that good translation. That's what the ESV happens to uh, use. Vindicated by the Spirit. That's a word that means to support a claim. Someone who indicates somebody else. Somebody else's claim, saying it, whatever it is. And what is the claim? To declare that Jesus' death met the requirements. Jesus' death met the requirements of a substitutionary sacrifice on behalf of sinners. To declare the work of the Holy Spirit, to declare that the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross for sinners, to save sinners, that is authentic. The Holy Spirit vindicating Jesus by the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me read it to you, Romans chapter 1, verse 4. He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness 
by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Did you read that, hear that? He was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit, the Holy Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Romans chapter 8, verse 11, speaks of the Spirit of God raising Jesus from the dead. And there are many verses in the Bible what God raising from the dead, vindicating him. He got it right. <laughs> Everything Jesus claims is the truth, is what the Spirit is saying. He wouldn't have risen from the dead if he had failed in his duty. We God raised him from the dead, vindicating his work on the cross. Now, some people, and I, I haven't pursued this, but I think this is an interesting thought. Some people think that in this, in this vindicated by the spirit line is, has to do with the change in Jesus' physical body from a physical body to a spiritual body at the time of the resurrection that he is the head of the new order, the new race. And we shall one day, those who believe in Christ and are sealed in him, will have spiritual bodies. First Corinthians, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. I find that intriguing. It's worth my looking into. Maybe you'll want to think about that too. But I don't want to uh, camp there. Let's move on. C, or the third, third point in the hymn, seen by angels. Now, I puzzle over this one. What's, what's the big deal about being seen by angels? <laughs> of course, Jesus was seen by angels. The angels were involved way back at the time of the creation. They, they saw that. They, they saw the fall of man in the garden and the, the, when they sinned against God. They saw man pushed out of the garden, sent out of the end of the garden. They saw the cherubim. beam. That's a, that means there was a whole army of high standing angels with a flaming sword. The sword had life in it. It wasn't just a sword. And each, the sword was alive itself to keep them from coming back into the, uh, into the garden. The cherubim beam over the Ark of the Covenant symbolized these angels. But for our purposes, there was particularly angelic involvement at the birth of the Messiah, wasn't there? And we could review those. And then his temptation in the wilderness. It says after the Lord was finished with the 40 days of being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, angels came and comforted him. So they knew him there. And at Gethsemane, at the end of his life, when he was praying, praying before he went to the cross in agony, it says when that came to an end, an angel came and comforted him. So yes, the angels saw Jesus in all the phases of his life. But I think particularly, I think particularly what this song has in mind is once again, the Lord's resurrection from the dead. And that angel who sat there on the, on the stone that was rolled away and said, he's not here, he is risen. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. Once again, vindication by, this time, angels. And then his enthronement and glorification in, he in heaven. The angels were there. I have no doubt about that. Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. After making purification for sins, he sat down, that is the Lord Jesus, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more, more excellent than theirs. I'm sure there were angels. I'm sure all the angels were there when they saw this great event of the Lord returning and sitting and glorified at the right hand of the majesty on high. The angels, the angels today can testify that he was seen by angels. Next line, we'll be very brief here. Proclaimed among the nations, his gospel claimed among the nations. That's right now, that's ongoing right now. We're involved in that right now. 
And then finally, from just like second half, believed on in the world. Those of us who are his, the faith through his mercy, his grace to us through the Holy Spirit are involved in that praise his name. And he says to us, as he does to the whole company of the redeemed, they are my, they are my people and I am their God. And then finally, taken up in glory. Jesus exalted to the right hand of God. God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's a lot in this hymn segment, <laughs> fragment. But there it is. All of this gospel truth, all of this truth that's inherent in the person and work and experience of the Savior, all that that fragment of a hymn teaches us, when considered carefully by a child of God, being led by the Spirit of God to understand it and apply it, all of that produces what's the word? Godliness in the heart and mind and life of the believer. It isn't just a matter of getting to know the facts. It's a matter of entering into the truth, the marvelous truth that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I wish we had the music, someone to write the music to that little uh, fragment, maybe, Maybe someone will someday, but the one I could get, the only one I could get close to, and I know time's going, it won't take long to finish now. The hymn that came to my mind when I was reflecting on this myself, and you will know it, and I suggest you might want to sing it on the way home, <laughs> or you're, you're already home, right? <laughs> uh, sing it after lunch this morning. Down from his glory, ever living story, my God and Savior came, and Jesus was his name. Born in a manger to his own a stranger, a man of sorrows, tears, and agony. What condescension bringing us redemption that in the dead of night, not one faint hope in sight, God, gracious, tender, laid aside his splendor, stooping to woo, to win, to save my soul. Without reluctance, listen to this, how this fits the, the, the hymn that we've just been studying. Without reluctance, flesh and blood his substance. He took the form of man, revealed the hidden plan. Oh, glorious mystery, sacrifice of Calvary. And now I know thou art the great I am. Oh, how I love him, how I adore him. My breath, my sunshine, my all in all, the great creator became my savior and all God's fullness dwelleth in him. Do you know him? Would you like to know him? He will embrace all who repent of their sin and trust him for all that he is as savior of sinners, vindicated by the Holy Spirit, seen of angels, and all the other aspects of his life and ministry and glory. Do you know him? Do you want to know him? He will embrace you. If you come to him in repentance, faith, realizing you need him, oh, you desperately need him, as your savior, Lord. If you turn to him in faith. Great is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. And there's one more, one more that I'm not going to talk, and I want to study this more. Maybe when I come back, I think it's April sometime, I may uh, raise this point, and I just want to think about it a bit. It may very well be the case. It may very well be the case. In fact, I, I'm sure it is. 
that what is being described here in this, this hymn is not only aspects, or not only that which will make us, if we rev, if we rejoice in these truths, make us godly. Understood correctly and more extensively is that it even refers to the godliness of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The most godly man who ever lived was the Lord Jesus himself. Passionate for his father. Passionate to, de to do his father's will. Passionate about saving his people from their sins. Godly. And I want to pursue that even more. We'll stop it there for this morning. Let me close in prayer. I was invited, I noticed, to, to close the service in prayer. So we'll close in prayer. And then uh, the meeting will be over, except I understand the microphones will stay on and there can be some dialogue. Let us pray. Now, our Father, in light of what we have studied and reflected upon in this hymn fragment, will you, by the Spirit of holiness, who declared the Lord Jesus to be the Son of God in power, by raising him from the dead, will you work in us? that piety, that godly fear, that reverent carefulness and concern for your honor. Oh, true God, that, that mystery of godliness that identifies all those purchased by the blood of the slain lamb. Will you work that in us, that godliness, to your pleasure, O oh God, and to your glory, now and forever. In the strong name of Jesus, Lord Christ, Savior, King. Amen and amen.